This is the story of a silent revolution that affects every person on the planet. It's about how we've become complicit in a deal that's reshaping our world. 20 years after its creation, the World Wide Web offers us unprecedented free access to information. The benefit of a freely available source of all the world's information that literally touches every human being who can get anywhere near an internet is phenomenal. The web is about connecting humanity. All right, the web is humanity connected. But the web's gift comes at a price. We pay in a commodity perhaps more precious than gold with intimate information about ourselves. People have to think more carefully about what information they want to put out and how it should be used. I think that people are only beginning to understand what it might mean to post things about yourself on the internet. You should lead your life differently. You should not post a photo. You probably shouldn't even take a photo that you don't want um, spread. I would advise against sex tapes. I've spent the last 10 years researching and writing about the web's virtual revolution. This film is about perhaps the most profound and disturbing shift in values that it's brought about and what that means for all of us. It's about how the thoughts and desires that we express on the web are being traced, tracked, and traded in pursuit of profit. The product online is not the content. The product online is you. This is the story of the individual, moral, and social cost of free, and whether that is a price worth paying. This is West Point. For over 200 years, the academy here has trained United States Army's elite military leaders. This is where MacArthur, Eisenhower, and Schwarzkopf all learned the art of war. In the 21st century, cadets are being trained not just in battlefield tactics and grand strategy, but in how to deal with the threat much closer to home. The web is now part of their curriculum. You've all heard of Trojans? It basically puts your computer in the, under the control of someone else. Lieutenant Colonel Greg Conti wants his cadets to understand how the web makes both governments and the people who use it exceptionally vulnerable. And there's numbers vary, but anywhere... The web's one of the most popular technologies in, in the history of mankind. Every day a new company comes online offering new products, new services, and the tools are very compelling and they're very powerful, but what we're doing is really disclosing an unprecedented amount of information about ourselves to third parties, and that makes me very, very concerned. Digital information is slippery, and, and once it's out there, it moves, and it, it can't, you can't put the genie back into the bottle once it's out there. Are we being naive about the amount of information that we're putting online? We all want something for nothing. So every website we go to, every shiny new tool or service that's out there on the web, many people flock to it. And we need to consider, as we're using those tools, what are we giving away in return for, uh, for this free product or service that we're getting? What are the risks involved, both on the what we're giving away and, and the fact that the service may disappear tomorrow or may be bought by another company? So we might like their mascot now, and we trust them and we like the colors of their logo, but they might not be the same company tomorrow. 20 years on from its invention, the web confronts us with a huge dilemma that's only now becoming fully apparent. Our everyday web use remains overwhelmingly free. We read news for free, we do searches for free, and we connect with friends and family for free. Or so we think. Few of us realize just how we are paying. How much would you charge to let a stranger read your personal diary? How much would it cost them to find out your religious, political, or sexual preferences, or where your children go to school? More than money can buy, but we give away exactly this kind of information routinely every day, and we're doing it on an enormous scale. 
In a month, users around the world make about 76 billion searches on Google for free. In a day, we post up 3 million pictures or videos to share with friends on Flickr for free. In a month, an estimated 350 million of us browse through the world's tens of millions of blogs for free. But now look at it the other way around. And you'll see that free is an illusion. Every month, Google gathers billions of search terms that help them refine their search system and sell highly targeted advertising. Every day, Flickr receives three million pictures or videos next to which they can place advertising. Every month, some blogs allow advertising companies to plant a tracking device known euphemistically as a cookie on our computers that reveal our interests to commercial networks so they can send us more relevant web advertising. The Silicon Valley entrepreneurs, I think they are the rubber balance of the 21st century, but their manner of presenting their ideas and their power is, is, is much cleverer more sophisticated than the 19th century. But I think in 100 or 200 years, when we look back at the Googles and the YouTubes and the Yahoos, we will see people very similar to the Carnegies and the Rockefellers and the Stanfords who drove the Industrial Revolution. The web had originally been created by scientists who wanted to share information between themselves. Commercial data traffic was outlawed. Back then, the web and money just weren't seen as things that went together. The spirit of the web at the beginning was of people working, as it were, under the bedclothes with a light on. People working after other people had gone home and installing a web server and sending me an email saying, oh, by the way, I, uh, at the end of work today, I, I installed this web server, I put some photographs on it, hope you like it. It seemed like a brave new world, it seemed like a new democracy, it seemed like a new way of people coming together. There was this other dimension to human experience, which is really hard to relate to today, that had nothing to do with money. But by 1994, the United States Congress had lifted the injunction on web commerce the web was suddenly open for business. People were now coming online in numbers. They still expected a free space, but commerce saw a new opportunity to make massive profits. While the early web was rooted in academia and the counterculture of California, the web's first great commercial venture had its roots in New York with a dream of a whole new interactive relationship with customers. I think the thing that we got right is a true obsessive focus on customer experience. Amazon has become the world's most popular online retailer. It has a customer base of 124 million people worldwide buying products that range from its core business, books, to anything from TVs to food to clothes. In 1994, Jeff Bezos was an analyst for a New York hedge fund. He was struck by commercial opportunities suddenly being opened up by the web. Web usage was growing at 2,300% a year, and I had never seen anything grow that quickly. And even though it was clear that the baseline usage of the web was very small. Most people hadn't heard of the web in 1994. It was also pretty clear that anything growing that fast, though tiny today, is going to be ubiquitous tomorrow. Bezos realized that the fundamental problem with conventional bookstores is their size. This one, for example, can hold about 5,000 titles, so no matter how well run it is, the choice will always be limited. What you could do online that you could never do in a physical store is build a bookstore with complete selection, universal selection. So that became the founding dream of Amazon. Where Amazon blazed a trail, others would follow. The commercialization of the web was the beginning of a revolution in shopping and a fundamental shift in the web's values. The rate of growth was astounding. If you needed any other reassurance that you were onto something huge, the company was just taking off like nothing else in, in the history of retail. The global instant and free space had become a global instant and free market. 
all around the world, entrepreneurs seized upon a way of making a killing. We were reinventing our entrepreneurialism, our kind of creativity. And maybe there was a sense that some of the older industries were changing. This was a time when youth and vibrancy and dynamism were going to be celebrated in this country in a kind of US style way. This was a very exciting time. I think sort of excitement was justified. Between 1995 and 2000, over 20 million dot-com names were registered. In a very few short years, we've got to the spectacle of billionaire teenagers with barely descended testicles spraying the stock exchange. Who can say what the e-world will be like in another five years? This optimism that always attends such a bright new technology and the future that it seems to beckon. It didn't last long, it didn't last long with me, not because I'm cynical, I think, but because history has given us enough examples. The brave new web became synonymous with printing money. Investor stocks have gone up an estimated one and a quarter trillion dollars. Sales online have doubled since last year. The, the 90s were insane. You were having just buckets of money poured over your head. In recent weeks, all the stock indexes have rallied to new records, led by the incredible surging internet stocks. How hot is NASDAQ right now? Smoking. Red hot. America Online, the auction site eBay, and the book dealer Amazon, all up more than 40% in December alone. The internet has become the center of the technology universe. The internet is being viewed, rightly or wrongly, as the next industrial revolution. So much money slushing around and people getting crazy valuations for their businesses. Every experiment got tried. Every experiment got funded, including the things that didn't make any sense. And yet, the dot-com boom had drawn millions of new users onto the web and made it mainstream. And companies had learned the lesson that it simply wasn't enough to create online versions of traditional shops. They had to rethink what the web could do that would allow them to make a profit. Today, there is a company that has worked this out better than anyone else. This company learned to make money from the web, but in doing so, it turned its consumers into commodities. How? By transforming our innocuous and apparently free search for information into an enormous money spinner. This company is Google, and it's turned our curiosity into its gold mine. Today, Google has an extraordinary grip over the web. Google today is better than Google yesterday because we just launched a bunch of things that made it better. And it'll be better tomorrow because we're going to launch a bunch of things tonight. It's constantly getting better. Google makes sense of the web. Every day, over two billion searches are made via its search engines in 40 different languages. Normally, you'd ask a smart person for advice on anything, but now you type into Google and you get tons and tons more information back than you ever got before. But it's not just search. Its free video sharing site, YouTube, is taking on television. We cross the one billion view mark uh, per day that we're serving. We can use Google to fly over the planet or even look over our neighbor's fence. It's even challenging the biggest computer company of all, Microsoft, with a browser and operating system to rival Windows. And unlike Microsoft, what makes Google so unique and so special is that they have become one of the richest and most powerful companies in the world by giving away almost everything that they offer to us consumers for free. To understand what appears to be a paradox, we need to peer behind the screens into the world that Google has built. This is the beating heart of Google. At data centers like this, Google stores information about the web and what we search for. In the last quarter of 2009, Google made over $200 every second from the transactions that passed through data centers like this. Its net profits for the year was six and a half billion dollars. And that money comes from advertising, tailored around information that we give Google. Every time we use Google, we help them make money. I've come to meet the editor of Wired magazine, Silicon Valley's Bible. He's charted the rise and rise of Google. 
One could definitely argue that Google is an advertising company. It's, you know, um, lots of people do search. And one could argue that Google search is not significantly better or worse than, than, than Microsoft's or AOL's or anybody else's. Um, but its hold over advertising is unmatched. Why do you think the Google business model has worked? The Google business model is genius. All of the things it does, calendar, mail, maps, photo management, all this sort of stuff, both can be given away for free because the cost of delivering that digital service to you is so low and increases your attachment to Google. And it will make money from you someday. And whether it makes money when you go to search and it runs ads there, whether it makes money because it's putting ads against other third-party content that you're using, if you have a critical mass of people using Google as a search engine and, and you know, the largest pool of ads against which to run against these search terms, you're able to match them better. And if you can match them better, advertisers are inclined to use you more. And this becomes a sort of self-reinforcing positive feedback loop. Um, what Google does has is not so much a monopoly on search. The switching costs of search are pretty, you know, one click away. What it has is the beginnings of a monopoly over internet advertising. Like the web itself, Google began as an academic dream. Stanford University in California has a reputation for academic excellence, but its alumni have a track record of converting research into money. You don't go to Stanford and not know that there is a very high probability that when you get to the end of graduate school, you are going to start a company, or you might never get to the end of graduate school because you're going to start a company. Back in 1996, Larry Page and Sergey Brin were PhD students investigating how they could sort the good pages on the web from the dross. The web then consisted of about 10 million pages compared to the tens of billions today, but it was expanding rapidly. So it was already impossible for humans to visit and rate each website. Page and Brin developed a way for computers to automatically do the job. I went to meet their mentor, Professor Terry Winograd, to find out more about their breakthrough. They realized that every time a person puts a link on their own web page to some other page, they are in a sense voting. They're in a sense saying, that's interesting enough for me to put a link there. And therefore, if they could add up all of those votes from everybody who built web pages, they would get a result which was going to be a very close approximation to what really is interesting to the general public. So what is the relationship between interestingness and search? So having figured out a way to decide which pages were interesting to what degree with PageRank, then it was possible to give search results that were much more useful. So when you did a search for computer, say, and it would find all the pages with, say, the word computer on it, then it, the ones that it gave me at the top, at the beginning, at the first page, would be the ones that have the most interestingness, which means that they're the ones I'd be likely to really want to go look at, not the, the stray junk. So that improved to a tremendous degree the kind of results you could give. This was perhaps the most effective search engine yet. Page and Brin called it Google. And Google benefited from the web's rapid expansion during the dot-com boom of the late 1990s because its link counting algorithm actually got better as more pages were added to the web. But they also faced a challenge. Each time someone used Google, they used a little bit of its computer servers. A single digital transaction, like a search, may have a negligible cost, but millions of negligible costs add up to a fortune. The problem for Google was that as the web expanded, it required more and more expensive processing power and more and more expensive storage. But it didn't have a real way of making sure that money was coming in. Larry would come back for advice now and then. He'd just come to the office and we'd have a chat and we'd talk about the technology and what they were building and it was all great. And then I'd say, well, but how are we ever going to make money with this? And he would give this sort of smile, a little look and say, I don't know, we'll figure that out later. Most search engines at that time were funded by advertising, but Larry and Sergey didn't like that. In fact, this is the research paper that they used to present Google to the academic community. And what they said was, we believe the issue of advertising causes enough mixed incentives that it's crucial to have a competitive search engine that is transparent and in the academic realm. This is what Google looked like in 1998. Free of adverts, simple, clean and white, 
Google's looks hark back to the amateurism of the early web. Yet whatever the ideals, Google still had to pay its way. What if you knew precisely what your customers wanted at any time and could instantly provide them with it? Well, that's the holy grail that marketers and advertisers have been searching for for decades. Because with that information, they could create tailor-made ads that would target directly the customers who were likely to buy their products without wasting money on the people who wouldn't. Just two years after voicing doubts about advertising, Page and Brin went into advertising and changed that industry forever with a system called AdWords. Type in a specific search term and specific adverts appear in two sections of the Google page. Now if you click on one of those adverts, money flows straight to Google as the advertiser pays for your traffic to their site. For the consumer, it's as simple as that. But what makes this special for advertising companies is that it's so targeted. A selling process initiated by a consumer looking for something in particular. Unlike the failed dot coms, AdWords seem to be the perfect marriage between what the web can do and what consumers want. The first rule of the internet is that you can speak to each individual as though they're a different person. It's not a broadcast mechanism, it's a narrow casting mechanism. And what AdWords is, is it's a single ad to a single person every time. Through targeted advertising to consumers, Google, and ultimately the web, had found a way to pay for itself. But Google's ambition ran even deeper than money. Page and Brin wanted to transform the web itself. They built into their advertising machine the analytical insight of their search engine. And crucially, this was what cemented Google's influence on the web. Their goal was to filter for consumers relevant ads from the irrelevant ones. So every time you activate AdWords by searching on Google, it unleashes a chain of events which can be illustrated like this. Let's say a car company wants to see their ad appear at the top of the page when someone searches for the words new car. They tell Google the amount they're willing to pay to make their advert appear. The process is actually an auction, so lots of companies might be competing for the top spot. But Google doesn't necessarily give the top spot to the highest bidder. It judges ads based on how relevant they are to the search and a range of indicators of the quality of the advertising company's website. In simple terms, P, the price the winner pays, is related to the value of bid multiplied by quality. This gets top billing. In this way, Google doesn't just rake in profits, but positions itself as a powerful arbiter of quality and relevance online. AdWords is what made Google the dominant player on the web. And very quickly, the rest of the web fell into line behind this model. Offer your products and your services for free while funding it behind the scenes with highly targeted advertising. Now, the irony is that this ultra-capitalist model requires that the web stay true to its non-capitalist roots. It has to remain an open network, easy to search, with no pay-per-view, and no areas that Google can't go. This open vision of the web also requires us users to play our part, consuming the eye candy in a virtual sweet shop of free content. The longer we're online, the more attention we pay, the more information businesses of all kinds can capture, and the more advertising they can sell. The product online is not the content. The product online is you. The product online are the eyeballs looking at that content, and as much information about how to influence the hands connected to those eyeballs as possible. So, we've seen that we pay for web search through being targeted with advertising. We pay for some email systems by having our emails scanned for advertising opportunity. And we pay for browsing sites by being tracked through cookies. Consumers are becoming the consumed. We are watched and traded. If this wasn't enough, Web commerce seems to be evolving one step further and perhaps in a more troubling direction. 
It's attempting to bury itself deeper in our minds, to try to shape what it is that we want before we even know that we want it. And this is where the old dot-coms come back into our story. Like Google, today many online retailers have got clever in collecting and analyzing information on their customers. We study your past purchase history and then use that in a statistical way to make predictions about what other things in this massive catalog of products that you might be interested in. What Jeff Bezos is talking about is a whole new level of interaction with customers and something that's defining the new commercialized web, recommendation engines. As you start looking for cameras, you start to see people who clicked, who, who looked at this also looked at that. People who bought this, people who clicked at this bought that. Um, you know, in, this, in the course of your clicking, the service becomes more useful to you. One way to think about that is we're sort of redecorating the store for each customer who walks in. If you think about a physical store, that would be impossible. You can't uh, run around and rearrange the furniture and put the products that that particular individual customer might like most up front. Very, very difficult. But in an online store, of course, you can do that. You can redecorate the store for each individual customer. You can help people find things that they might not have ever been able to find any other way. Recommendation engines enable businesses to constantly personalize their offerings to match our interests and behavior. This intimate knowledge of customers gives web companies a head start in competition with real-world retailers. Millions of people obviously enjoy these recommendation systems and are happy with what they get in return. But I worry that in the process, perhaps we've lost something. I wonder if recommendation systems don't defeat the point of the web. Isn't the vast possibility that the web offers for serendipity to bring us unexpected new ideas from accidental encounters, being replaced by a process that apparently broadens our horizons, but actually sells us the same things? Amazon, because we carry universal selection, really uh, dehomogenizes culture. It lets uh, people uh, pick the products that they want. You get to read the books that you want, not just the books that were cherry-picked and hand-selected to fit into a store of a certain size. But just because the web now enables us to choose from a vast selection, that doesn't mean we actually take up the opportunity. Faced with overwhelming choice, consumers tend to stick to what they know. In practice, what's become apparent is that we still huddle together in groups that confirm our existing beliefs. Now, for companies who want to sell us things, manipulating that little aspect of our psychology means massive financial returns. Recommendation engines are very good at figuring out what people like me would do and telling me what that is so I can then find out what people like me do. I can become much more like a person like me. We are 100% about trying to improve our consumers' enjoyment of movies. And we help them get the movies that they're going to laugh at most, cry the most, love the most. It's all about pleasing the consumer. And if that narrows, that's fine. If that broadens, that's fine. In 2006, the American computer giant AOL released a file containing every search made by 650,000 of their users over the previous three months. Each user was identified only by a numerical code. But one journalist at the New York Times was concerned that these outwardly anonymous searches in fact were so personal that they would reveal the identity of the searcher. How long would it take to unmask them? One kind of popped out at me, uh, I think in part because it had a lot of searches that were obviously local searches, like, you know, landscapers in Lilburn, Georgia was, was the one query. And that's not something you're going to look for if, if this is some mm. town, you know, across the country from yeah. you. Chances are you're looking for a local, uh, a local business. The user was known only as number 44177749. And this person's searches soon became much more intimate. 
There were a lot of searches for uh, medical ailments, yeah. uh, you know, effects of nicotine. There are some things about depression, yeah. oh, uh, paranoia, paranoia, about a whole paranoia. bunch about paranoia. You know, we sort of thought this was maybe an older, lonely man uh, with a lot of health problems. David was honing in on his prey. Along with the regular searches of businesses in Lilburn, Georgia, a lot of searches also revolved around the surname Arnold. I went onto an online phone book and looked up people with that name. There were 11 of them. Uh, one of them lived on Shadow Lake, and I went back and looked in the search queries. It said uh, Shadow Lake Subdivision, Gwinnett County, Georgia. And I said, you know, that's, that's got to be the person. After just a few hours' work and using nothing other than the searches and the telephone directory, David had identified his target. She was a 62-year-old woman called Thelma Arnold. She was pretty shocked and angry about this. She said, uh, you know, I had no idea someone was looking over my shoulder. You know, my whole, this is like my whole life is on here. Thelma explained that many of the searches for medical information were not for her, but for her friends who didn't have access to the internet. People are, are just typing in questions that they would probably never ask another human being, and yet, you know, here they are at their computer, and they, they think that the Internet is a source of all knowledge, and they have no idea that anyone is recording this stuff that they're, that they're searching for. Think back to the search terms that you've stuck into the search engines over the past week or so. It's likely that you can't remember most of them. But as the AOL story shows us, it's these incidentals that when pieced together can give us a surprisingly revealing picture about who we are. There are so many things that people do on the web now which are very, very intimate. In a way, if you know, if you know what somebody's web browsing on the web, you can you find out whether somebody is gay and wondering about coming out, looking at other people's stories. Somebody belongs to a religion that really is very different from the one around them. There are all kinds of very, very sensitive things that people do on the web. Are we simply sleepwalking into surveillance rather than thinking about the amount of information we give up on the web and how that might come back to us later? There are a lot of sort of social critics who say this is exactly how you devolve into, you know, a fascist state or a socialist state or a dictatorship, which is you invite it in and ignore the consequences and, and all of a sudden it's 1984, you know? Um, and I think there's some merit in that. An Orwellian future may seem a little far-fetched, but as masses of data about us is stored up on the web, the issue isn't so much who owns the data as who might own it in an unknown future. Dana Boyd is a sociologist at Harvard University who believes there are lessons from history in how data collected today can have unintended consequences tomorrow. There's been times in history where we've collected mass amounts of data without even thinking about how it would get used in the future, often for really good intentions. A good example of that is in the early 1900s, the Netherlands started collecting all sorts of information about its citizens for the best of intentions. One of the bits of data they collected during that period was people's religion in order to give people a proper burial. They had no idea that in 1939, uh, when the Nazis invaded the Netherlands, that that data would be used for what, how it was used. We have companies collecting massive amounts of data about citizens. People don't have an imagination of what it means to aggregate all of that data going forward. They have these expectations of what possible terrible things can be done with these huge digital dossiers. Frankly, most companies aren't quite sure what to do with them yet. The companies are still trying to work it out, which is why they're collecting all of this data. And they're not quite sure where it's going. But perhaps just as troubling as these huge automated databases are the databases we freely add intimate information to ourselves. The great wave of web innovation since Google has been in social media, networking through video, microblogs, and sites like Facebook and MySpace. Young people have pioneered this revolution, and Dana Boyd is studying how they feel about living in an online commercial space. There's so much data being collected about us online. Do you think that kids are complicit with this? Do you think that they know what's going on? Or do you think that they're naive about what's going to happen with their data trail? 
the irony is that young people actually understand the corporation advertising trade-off better than they understand the long-term implications of that data uh, and information. So one of the things you'll hear from young people is they'll say, well, if it gives me ads, you know, that means it'll be free. And, you know, I'd rather it be free. And part of it is they've never known a non-commercial world. Advertising is pervasive in their lives. The generation growing up with the web may be embracing commercial reality in return for free convenience. But aren't they missing out on what the old web once promised? What we've done is limited the range of human expression and activity on the internet to those things that are market friendly. Look at the devolution of people's personal presence online from the quirky, individualistic, highly personalized websites, the home pages of the HTML mid-90s, to the now utterly conformist and rigid profiles on something like MySpace and Facebook, you can no longer define yourself by anything, you must define yourself by what books you buy, by what movies you like, by what actresses you aspire to, by whether you are single, married, or looking. You know, by things that the market understands. But the problems facing the younger generation run deeper still. I'm concerned that there's little understanding of one of the fundamentals of digital information. Once it's on the web, it's almost impossible to erase. We have seen how we are all trading a little bit of our privacy each time we search and network online. In return for a free web, our privacy has become a commodity. We are economic units in what has become the new commercial frontier. We've entered this deal in many cases unwittingly, perhaps because a deal just isn't the experience that we think we're having on the web. On a computer at home or commuting with our mobile while traveling, we feel we're in a closed private bubble. But the reality of the web's open networks is that we are in effect always public. What we do on our computers has the potential to be seen, analyzed and used by others all around the world. The web disrupts our sense of public and private space. We're not just transacting with one computer, we're actually having a conversation with a multitude of computers across the globe, and we're being watched. That is what makes this such a revolution and the dawn of a new era. I don't like this extremist view that the web is suddenly a danger zone where unpleasant people can more easily find their vulnerable targets. You know, that's the extremities, as it always has been in every society, and as long as you educate to make people safe. I think the bulk of what happens in the web is interesting, exciting, supportive, fun, entertaining, and magic. Paradoxically, what makes us exposed as never before is also what makes the web such a magical opportunity to share roam and nose around in the riches of human knowledge. But as commerce comes to dominate the web, I believe we must wake up and understand the true cost of free, how it's redefining privacy, personal space, and perhaps ultimately, who we are. <laughs>